Well, as crews prepare to fix a leaking sewer pipe in Nampa tonight, drivers will need to watch out for a road closure. Leita from Karcher to Haley will be closed starting at 9 o'clock tonight. The closure will last until 5 in the morning tomorrow. The leak, of course, was discovered earlier this week. If it's not fixed, this line could interrupt service to about a quarter of the city. Now, a city spokesperson says that the sewage flow is lowest on Friday night, so that's why they're going to do the repairs tonight overnight, and those repairs can be done without interrupting service. Investigators say the people who were inside a trailer home when it exploded were making marijuana wax. Nampa fire investigators say the homeowners were extracting THC from the plant for a more potent product. That's the wax. The process uses butane, which is very flammable. Two people were flown to a hospital in Salt Lake City with burns over about 25% of their bodies. Three other people that are inside the trailer home are okay. Police haven't said if they will be charged. As federal safety inspectors investigate a death at a Caldwell seed plant, we are hearing from the company for the first time. A 63-year-old Parma woman was killed after her hair somehow became caught in the equipment. In a statement, the company writes, Our most heartfelt condolences, thoughts, and prayers go to, the, to Francis's family. Crookham has a 37-year relationship with them, and they are now our first priority. Flowers and a candle have been left in front of the plant in Francisca Gomez's memory. Operations have been temporarily stopped with only half a staff on site while OSHA investigates. A speech therapist accused of slapping an autistic student pleads not guilty. Prosecutors charge Lisa Carrier with misdemeanor injury to a child after they say she hit a boy at West Canyon Elementary School. Now the family of that boy has also filed a lawsuit against her. Also listed as defendants in that lawsuit, Valley View Superintendent and the West Canyon Principal. The trial of a man accused of being a hit man and also the man who was charged with hiring him kicked off this week. Sierra Oshwin joins us now live from the Yetta County Courthouse with a look at one victim's emotional testimony. Brent, one of the men was arrested in May, but he says he didn't pull the trigger. That led police to another man located about 2,500 miles away in Reading, Pennsylvania. He was arrested in July. Travante Calloway and Elliot Bailey were murdered in a Boise apartment last year. Calloway's girlfriend, Jeanette Jaraska, was shot in the arm but survived. She testified this morning. I don't want my name on anything. Why? Because... I was scared that they're going to come back for me. Who? The people that did it. Anthony Robbins Jr. and John C. Douglas each faced two counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. The men were arrested months after the shooting. Juraska testified the three were celebrating Calloway's birthday. She answered the door expecting a pizza delivery. And then what happened? The door pushed open and the shooter came in. Jaraska says she recognized the shooter. She had met him months before while working at a marijuana farm in California. Prosecutors say a drug supplier of Boise dealers wanted revenge on Callaway and Bailey after 30 pounds of marijuana was stolen from the home. Brent, the witnesses were not allowed to be filmed on camera. The trial continues on Monday and the court expects it to last about five weeks. Live in Boise, Sierra Oshrin, KBOI 2 News. After arriving in North Carolina, Pastor Saeed Abedini is spending time with members of his family today. The tearful reunion last night was with his mother, father, and sister, all captured on camera. This was at the airport in Asheville, North Carolina. Now, along with the family that you see here, the mother hugging uh, Pastor Abedini, his sister standing by, the father on the other side just out of frame. Also there was Franklin Graham, the son of evangelist Billy Graham. The family has asked uh, for privacy as they reconnect and heal with each other. Last Saturday, Abedini was released from an Iranian prison after over three years. Head to KBOI2.com. You can watch uh, the full reunion video. We apologize. We didn't have enough of it there. 
The uh, leader of the armed group that's occupying the wildlife refuge in Burns, Oregon, met with a federal official this afternoon. But Ammon Bundy left shortly after the agent did not agree to speak with him in front of the media. Bundy's group began occupying the refuge in eastern Oregon on January 2nd, protesting federal land use policies. An Idaho judge has dismissed a lawsuit against the state seeking to improve the public defense system. The American Civil Liberties Union of Idaho sued the state in June, claiming state officials have known for years that Idaho's public defense system is broken. They say defendants are not receiving adequate legal representation. In your legislative watch, your beer might be getting just a touch more expensive thanks to an ISP proposal making its way through the state house. But as Jeff Platt found out, the extra cost could actually end up saving you money in the long run. Well, Brent, here's the thing. I just bought this 64-ounce growler of beer, which is great, except for the fact that there's no consistent laws about them in Idaho, which means the second I walk out of the door to the bar, I'm technically in possession of an open container, and if I get in my car, I'm driving with an open container. That's why ISP wants to put a tape seal right over there on the cap. There's more growlers in the valley now that they're, they have to put some type of control on it. However, in Idaho, there is no definition for a growler, nor is there any law which outlines how one must be sealed. This combined with the fact that growlers are a to-go item creates a situation where many people are unknowingly breaking the law the second they leave the bar. In a statement emailed to us, ISP says in part, this is important so that a retailer or bar is not sending their customers out of the door with a container that is considered an open container under Idaho law. ISP says the tape seal is an effective, consistent, and inexpensive way to combat the issue, and one Boise Growler retailer agrees. It's a, it's a minimal cost. It's the same. It might be the same cost as actual, you know, a cap um, to put on the growler. So I don't think it'll. I don't think it'll change too much. In speaking to ISP, they estimate this will raise the cost of a growler of beer in Idaho about 10 cents a piece, which some people I spoke to don't mind. I'm not really worried about the 10 cent hike. While others are not excited to shovel out the dough. That's a bummer. If you drink a lot of growlers, that's unfortunate. Now, yes, while ISP says this is going to start costing you an extra dime, they do tell me that that open container ticket is actually up to $300, so you could be saving yourself a lot of money. Now, this rule did pass through the House committee yesterday, and it's going on to the Senate next week. Reporting live in Boise, Jeff Platt, KBOI 2 News. Idaho State Police uh, was slapped down by lawmakers. It had to do with what constitutes actual use of a liquor license. The Spokesman Review reports if a license isn't in use, it can be forfeited. The rule change would have meant a bar would have to be open at least 20 hours to be considered in use. But again, lawmakers rejected that proposal. If you've been to Sundance, you know how bad the traffic can get. So how about flying in? Coming up on KBOI 2 News First at 4, how much it will cost you to book an Uber chopper to the film festival. Plus, cutting edge surgery utilizing a robot, how it is reducing recovery time drastically. But first. We have a forecast that uh, I don't think we've had in 90 years. Nasty weather heads east. The precautions major cities and airlines are taking.
You're watching KBOI 2 News, first at 4. A winter storm that's already causing mayhem for people in the south as it moves up the east coast. As Craig Boswell explains, Washington, D.C. could get the brunt of the snow. A monster storm created treacherous driving conditions during the morning commute from Georgia to Virginia. People use snow blowers and small plows to clear the sidewalks in North Carolina. We have a forecast that uh, I don't think we've had in 90 years. This satellite image from NASA shows just how enormous the historic blizzard is from space. It's expected to sit over Washington, D.C. for the next 36 hours, dumping up to two and a half feet of wet, heavy snow. Officials are concerned about 50 mile per hour winds toppling trees on roofs and power lines. This is a life threatening type of storm. With the potential for three inches of snow an hour, district officials are making main roads and snow evacuation routes a priority. Get off the streets, you know, be safe, let us handle our business out here. Air travel has been challenging. A United Airlines plane skidded off the runway at O'Hare in Chicago. No one was injured, but other airports in the east are suspending service as a precaution. Along the Jersey Shore, it's not the snow, but a lunar high tide that has residents worried about coastal flooding, while New Yorkers are bracing for up to a foot of snow. I'm an Australian guy buying salt because <laughs> I'm scared of the blizzard. Officials say 50 million people are in the storm's path. Craig Boswell, CBS News, Washington. Yeah, well, they're getting ready for it. it. Sounds like the storm of the century. <laughs> well, uh, we'll have to wait and see how it actually ends up, uh, you know, yeah. piling up the snow. But yeah, it's significant. In fact, the amount of winter storm warnings that I see in association with this storm covering a huge chunk of real estate, friends. And this is what's happening right now. What we're looking at here is not satellite imagery, but what we're looking at is where the actual precipitation is. And this is where the core of the storm is. You can see it right there from the Gulf Coast region all the way across into the Appalachians into parts of the Midwest. And it looks like the storm is going to be zeroing in on the mid-Atlantic states into the northeast. The busiest corridor in the entire country is going to be directly impacted by the system. The pink shade right here, those are the winter storm warnings that are in effect. We're talking, as he mentioned in that story, 18 to 24 inches of snow. But it's not just that. It's the combination of the snow with the blowing and drifting of snow that has the Weather Service prompted uh, put up a... This is a blizzard warning that extends from New York City all the way down through Philadelphia, all the way down into the nation's capital, an area that is not designed for blizzards. They're going to get hit pretty hard. In the meantime, the storm that's going to be impacting us is going to be fairly benign, but it will deposit, I'd say, two to maybe six inches of additional snow on our ski resorts here over the next 24 to 36 hours. Now, the temperatures today still topping out. In the upper 40s, there's the average 38 degrees. And look at that low last night, 37 degrees. The average low for us this time of the year is 25 degrees. So it continues to be very warm. This is going to be the last of the series of storms that are going to be impacting much of Idaho, at least for the next five or six days. Now, the core of the storm is still off the coastline. And there you can see it advancing and it's moving southwest to the northeast. So as the low continues to move in, it is going to be tomorrow's storm. It is going to be impacting a fairly wide swath of western states here from the Idaho Panhandle all the way down into the Great Basin. I'm going to say scattered valley rain showers. It could commence as early as tonight and then on again, off again through the day tomorrow with the snow that's going to be commencing tonight on again, off again through the day tomorrow into early Sunday morning for our local mountains. Computer models then showing, right here's the moisture as it comes in. This is right around uh, midnight to about two o'clock in the morning. You can see some of the mountain snows already commencing. Might see a little shower activity. If you have any plans on going out this evening here in the Treasure Valley, there may be a couple of showers around. You may want to have an umbrella handy just in case. And then tom tomorrow, right around nine to 10 o'clock in the morning, here comes the leading edge of the front. There you can see the snow and the rain in the valley and then scattering of showers on again, off again through the day tomorrow. But then by Sunday, we start to dry things out. And once we start drying things out, it is going to stay dry for some time. Seven day forecast for the Treasure Valley. Here come the scattered valley rain showers tomorrow and then on Sunday. I'm going to say clearing skies should be pretty nice. Temperatures are going to stay in the low 40s. Then we start tapping into slightly cooler conditions on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. It will be dry. 
It's going to be a pleasant week, and the next storm probably rolls in here around the end of next week. The mountains will see snow tomorrow, and then hopefully again some snow by the end of next week. Here's your ski report. And as you can tell, nobody's had any reports of new snow, but the bases are doing very, very well. 67 inches at uh, Tamarack. Sun Valley has a 68-inch base right now. Palmerell, 94 inches. Anthony Lakes, 58 inches. And finally, Grand Targhee doing very nicely at 86 inches of snow. And Soldier Mountain has 70 inches up on top. I'm guessing by tomorrow they'll have some new snow to report. Yes, by this time tomorrow into early Sunday morning, they'll continue to see the periods of snow. Good. Yeah. Look forward to that. Good storm. Thank you, Roland. You bet. Doctors in Pittsburgh are performing new cutting-edge surgery using a new kind of robot. It was initially approved in Europe, but now it's available here in the United States. As Dr. Maria Simbra explains, experts say it's changing recovery time for patients. Surgeons at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center are the first to use a flexible robot to perform head and neck surgery. The concept of flexible robotics is going to be the next revolution in surgical advancement, surgical science. Krista Kaufman was one of the first patients to be operated on with a flexible robot. She had a growth on the back of her tongue. Without this new tool, she would have had a large incision in her neck, which would involve reconstruction and a longer recovery. More rigid robots are better suited to work on the joints, the abdomen or the chest where there can be more room. But in the head and neck, the structures are smaller, curvier, and flexibility is a distinct advantage. Tumors of the back of the tongue, of the tonsil, of even of the larynx or voice box region can be addressed with this flexible system. So how's your swallowing? Pretty good. Krista is glad surgeons were able to remove her growth with this new, less invasive technique. I thought it was cool. There's going to be a crater in the back of my throat for a little while. It's going to fill in and then everything's going to be pretty normal. Researchers say additional flexible robots are in the works that can be used for other surgeries. Dr. Maria Simbra, CBS News, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, together with the uh, Carnegie Mellon Institute, developed this flexible robot. Well, picking out a new fridge has gotten really complicated. Coming up in our Watching Out For You report, the new features you'll have to choose from and the steps you'll want to take to make sure you choose the right ones. Now take a look at tonight's primetime lineup for this Friday night. Good reason to stay indoors on this Friday night and enjoy some television.
You're watching KBOI 2 News, first at 4. You know, buying a new refrigerator used to be so simple. You could pick out the color, decide if you want the freezer on top or on the side, and that was pretty much it. But not anymore. Brian Morin shows us the long list of options now available. He's watching out for you. A modern fridge can come with many more doors, drawers, and displays. Here's a look at the bells and whistles. Before deciding which fridge to buy, first make sure which fridge will fit. If you're considering buying a new refrigerator, the first thing you want to do is get out the tape measure. You want to make sure that the refrigerator you buy is going to fit in the space you have, as well as it'll fit through the doors on your way into the house. A new fridge will run you anywhere from $500 to $5,000 or more. So take time to assess the food you typically keep in the house and how it's best stored. Budget is typically the biggest driver for decisions around refrigerators, but capacity of the refrigerator is also really important. Many people are also considering the type and style they might choose. For example, the top freezer is the most popular, but the other styles like the four-door refrigerators gaining traction. So a lot of consumers like to fit the biggest capacity that they can get in their dimensions. After that, you have features like twin cooling or door and door that will just add convenience to your fridge. Door and door models have only been around a few years, but they continue to grow in popularity. They save energy by allowing you to open a smaller door to retrieve the milk or ketchup without opening the entire fridge. Other features to think about, adjustable shelves, temperature control compartments, and even problem-solving software. So some of your high-end brands will have what's called a smart diagnostics. So in this case with LG, you have a little sensor up here that in case the fridge had a failure, you would hold your phone up to it while you're talking to LG and it will tell the repairman on the other end of the line what's wrong with the unit so he can come out and have the right parts with him. The more features you add, of course, the more you're likely to pay. If you're going all out, consider a fridge with a linear compressor instead of a traditional one. Driving to the Sundance Film Festival, it can really test your patience. But coming up on KBOI 2 News First at 4. When he first said it, I laughed actually. I was like, oh yeah, let's chop her into Park City. You heard right, the new chopper service Uber is offering and the dent it will put in your wallet.
You're watching KBOI 2 News, first at 4. Airlines have now canceled more than 6,000 flights today and tomorrow as a blizzard starts to cover much of the eastern United States. The nation's capital is in the crosshairs. And as Scott McLean explains, the city is shutting down. This is a bad storm. Parts of the East Coast could see more than two feet of snow before Sunday, while other areas will see severe icing, putting drivers in danger. States of emergency have been declared up and down the East Coast, with people preparing for the worst. Uh, it has uh, life and death implications, and all the residents of the District of Columbia should uh, treat it that way. A blizzard warning affects some 30 million people from Baltimore to Philadelphia to New York. The city's mayor says New Yorkers need to stay home. Any unnecessary driving should be avoided. Unless it is urgent, stay off the roads. It's as simple as that. Snow has already started to accumulate on roads. North Carolina has seen several fatal accidents due to the snow and ice. So we're asking everyone to please